Well, it's good to be with you this morning, or this morning. I'm used to speaking on Sunday morning, I guess. No. It's good to be with you tonight. Uh, we're going to work through a lot over the next uh, day and a half. And so um, the thing I'm going to ask you is just what's been said already. Pay attention to, to, to where we're at, to, to what we're doing. Uh, and I'm going to tell you right now where we're going. So there's not going to be any surprises as far as that goes. Uh, and the reason is, is I, I before um, in my adult life, before I was a full-time pastor, I uh, was a cop for six years. And so I did a lot of fun stuff. I was on an SRT team. So I did search warrants and all that fun stuff. And when you do a search warrant, you know everything that's going to happen. All right. Every single detail. So I'm going to give you the details of where we're going, of the text we're going to be looking at. So that way, you know where this thing is headed. All right. So tonight we're going to look at biblical manhood and womanhood as we see in creation from Genesis one and two. All right. Then tomorrow morning, we're going to look at biblical manhood and womanhood in the fall in Genesis three. And then tomorrow night we'll be in Romans chapter eight to talk about the redemption of biblical manhood and womanhood. Now, Tonight and tomorrow, the truth is, is that I have the easiest job, right? Because we're looking at some of the big picture things. And at least until tomorrow night, uh, you guys aren't asking any questions. And so really it's, it's the people that are at the home with you, the people that are going to be here in the workshops with you. Those are, those are the people that have it the hardest because those are the times where you're going to find yourself asking questions before we get to tomorrow night. So with all of that in mind, I want to begin tonight by defining two things for you so that you understand what we're talking about. The first is truth. All right, now this, this is according to the internet, so it has to be true, right? Uh, these are the definitions of truth that I want you to keep in mind as we're working through all of this. The first is the body of real things, events and facts. So something that when, when you use the word actual, that's what we're talking, something that actually happened, right? The next thing is this. The state of being the case. That's a fancy way of saying something that's a fact. So we know for a fact. And then the truth that we're focusing on tonight and over the next day and a half is capital T truth. And what is that? It's transcendent, fundamental, spiritual reality. All right. So those are definitions of truth. We're talking about capital T truth, though, throughout the next day and a half. And the second thing I want to define for you, because it's going to become important, is the word worldview. Now, what is a worldview? It's basically a lens by which you view everything in the world. So culture, yourself, all of those things are viewed in light of your worldview. And as Christians, for us, that worldview comes through capital T truth, the spiritual reality. So everything that we have as Christians in this world is viewed through when I say capital T truth, the word, the Bible, God's revelation of himself. Now, when it comes to issues, and I'm talking specifically about cultural issues, when it comes to those sorts of things, we as Christians have to be a people of the book, right? We have to look to the Bible. What that means is as you're living in this world, you're not to allow the culture to be the lens through which you view everything, right? So the things that are happening in your life, you're to look to the scripture and say, okay, this is happening in my life. What does the scripture say to me in these moments? When it comes to matter of right and wrong, where do we go? We, we go to the scripture, right? When it comes to your parents, where, where do you go to find truth, regard, capital T truth regarding your parents? You go to the word. When it comes to church, our understanding of the gathering of God's people, where, where do you go to find that? You go to God's word. When it comes to how we view ourselves, we have to go to the word. And listen, this is not the most awkward thing I'm going to say, but when it comes to gender and sexuality and understanding all of that, you know where we find the truth? The word. Our source of truth, your so source of truth I'm just going to throw this and get this out of the way right now. Your source of truth does not come from some dude pretending to be a girl or some girl pretending to be a dude 
on TikTok or YouTube. That's not where we gather. That's not where we gather truth to formulate a worldview. We look to God's word. Why? Because it's sufficient. Bible itself says that God is not a God of confusion. So if the world is confusing and you need a worldview that is not confusing, you open the Bible because the God of the Bible is a God of peace, a God of clarity. And when it comes to these these big questions that we see in the world, the, the questions that you guys are facing that some of the older folks in the room never had to face, when it comes to those things as a Christian in this world, you have to let God draw the line in the sand, right? Not, not your teachers, not when you go to college, not university professors. It's the word, God's word, the only thing that has the final say. And this weekend, what we're doing is we're waging a war. We're waging a war through truth against culture, against social media, against influencers. And we're doing that. You're here because all of this is worth it. Because what's at stake is eternity. And I recognize that for some of you it's awkward because there's a guy standing in front of you that you have no idea who I am. You don't know much about me. You have no reason to trust me. I get that. In fact, you have no reason to believe anything I say. And I tell the church, my church this all the time, don't believe me. You need to go and find out for yourself. This weekend is not about me. It's not about me speaking. In fact, I would be perfectly fine if five minutes from now, you don't remember me, but you remember something that was said from the word. Five months from now, the same. Because I'm not here to, I'm not here to be just another voice in the mess, right? I'm here this weekend to tell you what God has already said and to show you this is how we align our lives if we're gonna function in this world as healthy Christians who make a difference, who honor God above all else. Second Peter chapter one says this in verse three and four. His divine power has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us to his own glory and excellence by which he's granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from corruption that's in the world because of sinful desires. What does that mean? It means that the Bible has everything that you need for life and godliness. Everything you need for life and godliness. You don't need me. You need the word. You need God this weekend. And one of the things you need to understand about this is that this, these sessions are Again, the easy part. It's the easy part. We're going to talk about these big ideas and then, and, and we have to do it that way, right? If I were to walk through every single thing that the Bible says about being a, a man of God or a woman of God, this wouldn't be Disciple Now weekend. It'd be Disciple Now year because it would just take that long for us to work through it. So we're talking in here, big picture, right? And so you need to write down questions that you have so that you can ask those things. Because at the end of this weekend, I don't want you to be confused about anything. I don't, I don't want you to, to not understand something. I want, if, if there's something I say that's crazy and you just, you're not getting it, tell me so that we can talk through it, right? I, I really am an approachable guy. I haven't arrested anybody in a long time, so I'm not going to start tonight. But we're, tonight, we're starting in Genesis chapter 1. And when it comes to creation, imagine this, but, but there's a lot we can learn about God, but guess what, about ourselves. We can learn about biblical manhood and womanhood from the first two chapters in Genesis. I know that's not shocking to you because that's, that's why you're here. But I want to show you something. I want you to notice something right off the bat here because this is important. When we start diving into Genesis chapter one, I want you to notice the amount of order that's there. 
That it's not, it's not a bunch of chaos that's happening and it just coincidentally works out, right? But there's order. And I, I want you to remember this, right? It starts, every day starts with an announcement, right? God said something. Then there's a commandment, God, let there be. Boom, commandment. Then there's a presentation, God made it. And then the last thing is there's an assessment where God says, for all intents and purposes here, that something is good. Creation, right now, always is not a mess. A sovereign God was responsible for it all. And in that creation, there's order. There's intentionality, right? Nothing that happened in the first two chapters of Genesis happens by chance. We're going to walk through quickly the first chapter of Genesis because then we need to get to Genesis chapter two. And I, um, I'm a professional at speaking a long time and I don't have a long time. So buckle up. All right. Genesis chapter one says in verse one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, why is that important? Again, there is intentionality in the beginning. God created. Now that word in the Greek and you don't, I mean, in the Hebrew, you don't want to know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because it's important. But God created, the word there is, is God completely created. That, there's no accident. There's no happenstance. And God created the heavens and the earth. Why is that important? Because that's, that is the organization of all things. That's how we understand creation as heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, I told you we're going to go through Genesis 1. We're not. We're just going to go through a few verses so you can see it and then go home or go wherever you're sleeping and then read the rest of it. But Genesis 1 verse 3, and God said, told you that was going to happen, right? God said the announcement, let there be light, the commandment, and there was light, the presentation. And God saw that the light was good, right? An assessment and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning the first day. Verse six, and God said, announcement, let there be an expanse. Again, the commandment in the midst of the waters and let, that, let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, the presentation, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Verse 9, and God said, announcement, let there be waters. You see how this is going, right? Nothing is just happening by chance. God is intentionally doing something. That, that's important for us because it shows us that all of this is ordered on purpose by God himself. Why is that important? Day six. If you flip over there, you see in verse, let's start in verse 26. And then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing on the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. What does that mean for you? That means for you, as a human being in this world, that God created you on purpose. There's order in the way that God created mankind. Male and female, he created them. What does that mean? That means that any deviation from that created order is not God. Right? God's told us, he's laid it out, capital T truth. And what does that mean in creation though? For us as male and females, one of the things it means 
is that we have been created on purpose sexually. Now, I said earlier to a few folks, I have the humor of a 14-year-old boy. So when I say the word sexually from the pulpit every time, it's hard not to crack up, but I got to do it, right? I, I got to keep us on point here. But in creation, there are plants and animals that are asexual. You know what that means? They produce, reproduce within themselves. That's important because God didn't create us that way. He could have created everybody at one time and didn't need reproduction at all. He could have, but he didn't. Every act of creation by God is ordered. It's ordered even when it comes to us as males and females. Now, with that, although we're created in the image of God, I understand that we are different. And it's weird to me that we live in a world that Genesis chapter 1, 26 and following, has become the most controversial Bible verse that's ever existed. Not, not all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Not it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. Not he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Be holy and blameless before him. Not God hates all evildoers and all thoughts. That's not controversial anymore. What's controversial in this world is Genesis chapter 1. That God created mankind in his image. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Two complementary forms. Now, for us human beings in the room, we call them the sexes, right? Male and female, man and woman. And what we learn from the scripture is that he created us intentionally and that's built within our bodies. What does that mean? Our bodies are a witness to this, right? We as men and women are complementary in some ways, but, but different in other ways. We, we function different. We are all, though, the same. We're all created in the image of God. That's a part of this, in his image. What does that mean? It just means there's a whole lot of it that it means, but I'm just going to give you a few of the things. One of them is that we hear God. Now, he speaks to us now through his word. That's how we hear him speaking to us. That's how he does it now. But in Genesis chapter 1, he, he literally says to them, right, be fruitful and multiply, so do the earth. We hear God. Also, we have the ability to have relationship. We have the ability to have relationship. But also, we have a soul. Unique in creation, what we're going to see in Genesis 2 is that we've been created with a soul. We are, we are spiritual beings. We have that connection that we can make with God when, when we are genuinely saved, when we have genuine salvation, and our lives are transformed by the gospel. Another part of this is we're created to do work, to do things. We're not to be bumps on a log. We're not fill chairs or pews. We're to actually do stuff. Those, that stuff is what we call mandates. And you're going to talk about this in some of the workshops and things like that. But part of that mandate is to be fruitful and multiply and subdue creation. What does all of that mean? Well, first off, be fruitful and multiply. Again, if you laugh, I'm going to laugh, so don't. The issue there, part of it is procreation. Right? Adam and Eve are the first two human beings, so there, there must be other human beings. And the way that that happens, it's through the act of procreation. That's all I'm going to say about that for now. But also subdue creation. What does that mean? We're to rule over creation. That's the intention in this. Adam and Eve had a job to do. They were to name the animals. We'll see in a minute, Adam, at least. They were to keep the garden, look after things, basically be co-heirs, right? Look after the creation of God. 
And I want to show you something from Genesis chapter 2 about some of the specifics in this creation. Because Genesis chapter 1 is like a big picture of creation of mankind. But, but listen to what happens in Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to skip to verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant on the field yet sprung up, the Lord had not caused rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Now, why is that important? We saw order, Genesis 1. There's order in the climate, in the way things are happening. And it says then in verse 7, the Lord God formed, formed, intentional, deliberate action that God took. And it says that God formed the man. In the Hebrew, that word is Adam, Adam, right? And he formed the man from the dust, which is Adamah. You add an A to the end of Adam. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. It's not just that God created you intentionally. Whether you're male or female, he created you intentionally. But it's not just that. What we see here is that in the Genesis account, God is creating mankind uniquely in that we're the only ones that are created with his breath of life. What does that mean? We have a soul. We have a connection, a spiritual connection to our creator that no other creation has. Right? I'm sorry, this may hurt your feelings, but all dogs don't go to heaven. Right? And I love my dog, Wrangler. He, the unconditional love he has, but he doesn't have a soul, right? We, as human beings, have that unique element to us in creation. Something that no other part of it has. It's a zoomed in picture of Genesis 1.26. And look what it says in verse 8. And the Lord planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put man whom he had formed. God even orders where they're going to live. He orders where they're going to work, what they're going to do. If I had all the time in the world, we'd go through every bit of this. But I want you to look down at verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Subdue the earth. Subdue the earth. How, how does that happen? By working in the, in the place that God put them. They're going to work it. They're going to keep it. It's that mandate. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you are surely, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now that surely die, dying you will die is what it means. Why is that important in all this? Because there is clear instruction Right? In the world, if you go on TikTok tonight, in the world, you can watch a whole lot of videos and end up very confused. But in God's economy, in the way that he orders all of this, there, there's not confusion. There's clarity, right? All the trees you may eat of except this one, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. So God gives clear instruction to Adam about how this thing works. And then the Lord God said, for the first time, it's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper, fit for him, a suitable helper. What does that mean? A counterpart. Right? We, we know this. There, look, I understand that there are loners in the world. I, honestly, and this is weird because of the profession I'm in for what I do, but I would just rather be left alone, right? Let me play my video games. Let me, let me just do my own thing. Just leave me alone. But the truth is, is that that's fun for a minute. But because of the way we were created and the intentionality that we've been created with, every one of us longs for relationship. 
And Adam is going to name all of these animals. And, and the problem is that as he's naming these animals, he's seeing the relationships that exist within the creative order. And so God sees that too. He says, this is not, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to create for him a suitable helper, someone that's going to come alongside him. In fact, someone who can help him fulfill those mandates. It, again, we aren't created asexually, so be fruitful and multiply. It's a part of fulfilling that mandate, right? It says, now, out of the ground, the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, it was that, that's, that's his name. Again, intentionality and order. And the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. That's why it's not good. And so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, and closed up the place of the flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of the man. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they'll become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. God orders how all of this happens. Now, why, why is this important for us? Because there's a culture and a world out there that tells you that God made a mistake. That I was born in the wrong body. Or some, not even that extreme, right? Some some voices in the world are not just saying that, but they're saying, listen, I, I don't belong on this planet at all. But everything that we see in Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two tells me that it doesn't matter how you feel right now in this room. God created you in the body he created you in on purpose. God wasn't creating you and then he sneezed and created your neighbor, right? No, all of this intentional, on purpose. Why? Not just to subdue the earth and multiply. That's a part of it. But the ultimate goal in all of this is the glory and honor of God. Always has been. They were created to do these things. They were equipped and called to do these certain things, to fulfill these mandates. But it wasn't even about the mandates. It was about God honoring obedience through the act of procreation and through the act of subduing the earth. Now, when I say the act of procreation, I need to be careful and I need you to listen carefully. Again, because of the world. We need a, we need a worldview that is consistent with scripture. And when I say procreate according to the scripture, what I don't mean is whenever, with whoever, for whatever reason. What we just read at the end of Genesis chapter two is that God created order and intentionality, even in procreation, that it happens under one condition, the covenant of biblical marriage. What does that look like? Verse 24, therefore a man should leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they will become one flesh. There is unity that happens in covenant marriage. That unity is a unity of purpose and of mission, but also it's a, it's a physical part of it too. And it says, and the man and his wife are both naked and not ashamed. Why is that important? It's important because in the covenant of marriage, there's, there's no shame. Now, when you first get married, it, it's awkward, right? We're going to find out tomorrow from Genesis chapter 3 that when sin enters the picture, that there, there's shame, there's guilt, there's all those things. We experience even still the result of that in shame and guilt through our own sin. But in, 
in the first biblical marriage before sin enters the picture and everything is ordered perfectly according to God's intentionality, according to God's economy, there's no shame. There's no shame. Let me think how to say this without saying anything that's going to get me in trouble. As created beings, with all the intentionality that's there, we have to understand that being fearfully and wonderfully made is absolutely true, that God has never made a mistake. And the reason we're looking at it this way is because the easiest thing for me to do tonight would be get, to get up here and, and just to say, here are, th- here are three or four things that we see in Genesis chapter one. Remember these three or four things. But, but I don't want us to just remember three or four things. I want you, because you're, you're gonna be engaging in the culture and in, in the world, I want you to be able to say, listen, man, li- ma'am, don't say man to your elders or anything. I don't want you to get in trouble, but listen, ma'am, I respect where you're coming from and what you're saying. However, I understand that from the God of creation that he has ordered things in his way. And his way is that male and female, he created them in his image and his way. And we're going to rule and we're going to reign over creation. Now, right now, that, that's, we'll see tomorrow, it's, it's messy right now. But even still, in this room, with sin in the picture, we are all the same, but also very different. We hold on to the reality that we're created in the image of God. We hold that truth very tightly, but also that we're different, right? And and the reason I have to say that is because because of the nature of the world. There's male and female. And within, even within that, there's order and intentionality. Not only are we different physically, but only women bear children. That, that's the way God made it, right? Health, if you're healthy, you can bear children. Men, a man can't bear children. I don't care what anybody else says. That's, that's just fact. It's scientific fact, right? It's truth. Men can either give an X or a Y gene in procreation. Women only give an X. Again, fact, it just happens that way because God designed it. God has ordered it that way. It's just God's way. It's just the way things are according to our sovereign God. And we have to hold on to that. The the problem in the world is that the church by and large has not held on to that. You have all these people who have all these different ideas and they, they'll twist and mar the scripture to where it's unrecognizable just so they can have a position that fits the way they feel. Frankly, tonight, I don't care how you feel. I'm telling you that God created you intentionally on purpose. And if there's a struggle within you, I, look, I don't know you, but if there's a struggle within you, if you, if you are a male in this room, but you, you have struggles in your life about identity issues, That happened because of what we're going to see tomorrow morning. God still created you the way that he created you. It's because of sin that we have those sorts of feelings and those sorts of thoughts. We can't be, as Christians in this world, we can't be sexual consumers. We can't be cultural consumers. Because the culture is always changing. They don't care about capital T truth. It has to be God's way. It has to be. But what went wrong? Why are there so many different opinions about all of this? Why is there so much confusion in the world about things like gender and sexuality? Why is there so much confusion about roles in the home, about men and women in general? Why is there so much 
I guess you'll have to come back tomorrow so we'll find out. But that's what we're going to see in Genesis chapter 3. This is not overly complicated. It's, it's really not. It's not an issue of biology. It's an issue of creation. And I'm telling you, if you don't hold fast to the truth, then you're going to find yourself wrapped up in a world that is so confusing and so messy. You're going to find yourself in, in a place that you don't want to be in. You're going to wonder, what, what happened? Where did, I, where, did I, where did I start getting things wrong? Where did things go sideways in my life? And I hope that you remember, before you get to that point, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, that God created you on purpose. That God called you and gifted you uniquely. Now, not everybody in this room is, going, is a farmer or a gardener like Adam and Eve would have, were, were going to be originally. But even still, whatever you find yourself doing, God created you and gifted you for that purpose. I think it was Vody who taught, gave, and I think not just him, but Owen Strand too, that, that gave the example that you have a hammer and a screwdriver, right? If, you, if you've ever had to screw something in, right, you're putting up a light fixture. If you try to use the hammer to do that, it's, it's not going to go right. Just like if you need to nail something in, you try to use a screwdriver. It just doesn't work. Why? Because, because when things don't work as they're created, it turns into a mess. And we're laying a foundation this weekend to help us navigate that mess that we're going to see tomorrow morning. And I just hope that for you, that you are willing to ask the hard questions about all of this. Tomorrow night when we sit down, I'll, I'll be up here every... The, the pastors will be up here to answer those sorts of questions. Now, the good news is, because I'm not a pastor here, that um, I have the ability to lateral to, to them. Uh, and so if you, I want you to think of the hardest questions on the planet. Like, why did, did Adam and Eve have a belly button, right? Those are the things I want you to ask. All right? Just because I want to see how they answer. But I, I am thankful for what God has done and what God is doing and the fact that he's given us truth that we can look to. And I just hope that you embrace that this weekend as we work through some of these delicate issues culturally anyway. And that you'll walk away from this knowing that God created you just the way you are and he created you on purpose intentionally. All for his glory and his honor. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna sing a song. Father, we are thankful for your grace, for your mercy, for the truth of your word, that it shows us who we are. I thank you, God, that we don't have to log on to an app. We don't have to go on social media. We don't have to go to YouTube to try to find out why I'm here. But instead, we open up the truth of your word and we see it so clearly that, that you have put me here right now on purpose to live for your glory and your honor. And we do that ultimately by living in obedience to you. In Genesis chapter one, we see that through being fruitful and multiply, but also subduing the earth. But Father, tonight we trust in the truth. We submit our lives to the truth. And I do pray, Father, if there is anyone here that is dealing with issues of who they are or why they're here, that you would remind them through the truth of the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2 exactly what they're here to do, to live in such a way that brings glory and honor to you, to live a life worthy of the gospel. Father, help us to see the truth, to put the truth into action in our lives, and help us to open our hearts to understand where all of this gets twisted in Genesis chapter three tomorrow and how it all gets turned back around tomorrow night. God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.